open the gates, fans will be allowed back inside Lincoln Financial Field for football games starting this Saturday. But not all at once. We've got that story, plus some student athletes who are being commended for their work off the field. Our sports update starts right now. time of week once again welcome back to another episode of Owl Sports Update virtually alongside Jackson Neal I'm Brooklyn Vaughn. After weeks of delays Temple's football team finally took the field against Navy this past Saturday we take you back to Annapolis to catch you up on that but first we look ahead to Temple's home opener against USF this Saturday and some news that goes along with it. Temple announced earlier this week that starting this Saturday fans will be allowed in Lincoln Financial Field for games. At first, just family members of the players and coaching staff will be allowed through the gates. But if all goes well, the university will offer a prorated season ticket plan for the Owls' remaining three home games against SMU, East Carolina, and Cincinnati, with priority access for fans who previously renewed their season tickets for 2020. This news comes after the city of Philadelphia announced that it will follow Pennsylvania's guidelines and allow up to 7,500 fans in large outdoor venues, such as the Link. With more on this, including player reactions, we bring on Al Sports Update's Tyre Hood. This past Tuesday, the city of Philadelphia announced that they will allow a 15% capacity of fans in the stands. But Temple is offering a different approach to this plan at the link. A momentum shift. A huge first down. The fans are what gives teams that home field advantage, and that's back in play for Temple football. On Tuesday, the city announced that the link can seat up to 7,500 fans for its games this fall. If the maximum occupancy is less than 2,000, we would allow 20% of the maximum occupancy. And if the maximum occupancy is greater than 2,000, we would allow 15%, up to a total of 7,500 people. The players are once again excited to be playing in front of the hometown fans. You know, anytime we can get any fans in the link, you know, that's huge for us. We kind of thrive off the energy that they bring. Um, I know anytime we hear that fight song going and the fans cheering and dancing along, you know, that gives me goosebumps right now just thinking about it. Individuals will once again be allowed back at the link. However, there is a catch. For this Saturday's game versus UCF, Temple is allowing players and coaches to invite their family members only. At least for game one. Yeah, of course. Um, huge. My dad's like one of my biggest supporters. Um, I've yet to call my mom yet, but my dad called me immediately. So I, I was talking to him. He, he said he's going to try to be at the game as soon as he could get there, and as soon as they could let him in. If all goes well versus UCF, Temple says it will start allowing season ticket holders to attend games that will begin on November 5th versus SMU. Temple averaged almost 30,000 fans per game. With a cap of 7,500 this season, no matter how you look at it, there will be many fans still relegated to watching the Owls on TV. Reporting for Owl Sports Update, I'm Tyre Hood. Owls sit at 0-1 after a tough loss in Annapolis this past week, but now it's all eyes on USF. The Bulls come to the link for Temple's home opener and homecoming at that. Looking at the numbers between USF and Temple, the Owls appear to be the favorite even after their loss. South Florida has had trouble stopping offenses all season as their defense ranks in the bottom third of the conference in points allowed. This bodes well for a Temple offense that gained more than 400 yards against Navy. While the Owls defense struggled against the midshipmen, this week could be their chance to bounce back as South Florida's offense ranks dead last in scoring in the American. All this gives the Owls an overwhelming advantage in ESPN's Football Power Index. With the building anticipation of Saturday's game, there are also a few questions Owls fans are left pondering after that tough loss to Navy. We now welcome Inside the Nest reporter Sage Hurley to talk a little bit more about these concerns. Hey Sage, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. 
All right, let's jump right into it. What does Temple's defense need to do in order to stop USF? If Temple wants a win, the defense is going to have to redeem themselves. Navy's triple option offense is unique, but there is no excuse for allowing 251 rushing yards when last season the average was around 160 per game. USF's quarterback, Jordan McLeod, can run, so the defense is going to need to keep an eye on him. Okay, and player swatch on both sides of the ball. Who do you got? As for the Bulls, sophomore running back Johnny Ford could be a headache for Temple secondary. Even in USF's beatdown from ECU, he was still able to put up 136 all-purpose yards. And sticking with the running back theme, as for Temple, I anticipate that Ray Davis and Tavon Ruley will have a huge role in the offense, especially because USF's defense does a better job with pass coverage. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Sage. It's always a pleasure. You can catch Sage and the entire Inside the Nest crew every single Thursday at 1 on TUTV for all things Temple football. Thanks, guys, for having me. They're really a high Temple offense. Uh, I've seen them in a couple of games uh, against, uh, I think, I seen ECU. Um, they're a really high Temple team. Um, I feel like we just will have to match their Temple. I think you finally saw them kind of settle in offensively last week. You know, I think they've been working to find themselves with a the new staff and what have you and going through what they've been going through. And certainly it feels like they've settled on him for this week. And uh, that'll be a challenge. Well, a lot of times what they showed you before the snap is what you were going to get. The tendencies on, hey, if this guy starts here, he's more than likely going to be rotating here at the snapper, different things like that. But, you know, it's only Tuesday right now. Twitter talk. Last week we asked you, could the Owls beat the midshipmen? Unfortunately, 97% might have lost some money if you put your wallet where your guess was. For this week's poll, we're asking you guys, now that the city is allowing fans, will you feel safe going back to games at Lincoln Financial Field? Follow us at Owl Sports Update and sound off on our Twitter to get involved in the conversation. After a few back and forth scoreless minutes, Navy finds its way on the board first with this Jamal Carruthers touchdown. Navy's backfield wreaked havoc all night, especially on this one, third and long for Navy, and CJ Williams breaks away to set the midshipmen up for their second touchdown. And there goes that man, Nelson Smith, who led Navy's sure run game with 120 yes. yards Nelson and two Smith. touchdowns. He this was one of them. Touchdown. Just over five minutes left in the third, and the Owls start to rally. Anthony Russo, Russo. finds Brandon Mack in the end zone, and in the Owls' following drive, Wide they strike open. again. Russo brings it in for his Russo first rushing touchdown of the day. Time Russo running out now, and the Owls get tricky Temple. with it. The flip to Brandon Mack, who lets this one fly to David Martin Find Robinson and put the throw. Owls at first and goal. Call Russo scores again. David it's a two-point game, and it all comes down to this two-point conversion to tie it up. Russo to a fully Captain covered Ray Davis, Russo and it's knocked away. away. Navy comes out on top. Final score, 31-29. Um, obviously not the result we wanted. I'm very disappointed. Um, just, you know, a couple critical errors there on offense and too much field position, special teams wise, and certainly, um, you know, defensively, we got, we got to be better than that. That wasn't, that wasn't good enough. On Saturday, the Owls defense was not able to contain the triple option in Annapolis. Right from the start, Navy set the tone with an opening drive that totaled 75 yards on the ground and led to the game's first touchdown. The midshipmen only threw the ball twice all day as they finished with 251 rushing yards. This rushing attack allowed Navy to control the pace of the game as they beat Temple in the time of possession battle by 11 minutes. Temple wasn't able to stop Navy's long possessions, allowing the midshipmen to go a perfect 4 for 4 on fourth down conversions. While most of the Owls' defense struggled, linebacker Isaiah Graham Mobley was a lone bright spot, recording 14 tackles and a sack. However, if we only told you about his play on the field, we would be telling you half the story. Our Sports Update's Emily Cochran has more. Thanks, Jackson. Not only is Isaiah Graham Mobley an outstanding player on the field, but his academics and community service give him the title of an all-around athlete, one that is being nationally recognized. At stake, a 25-pound bronze trophy and the title as one of the nation's top athletes. Linebacker Isaiah Graham Mobley has been nominated as a semifinalist for the William V. Campbell Trophy, given to the player who best combines academics and community service with on-the-field performance. Huge honor, you know, it's just 
what you work for every day, especially as like since you're a little kid, you kind of just, you know, dream about it. And then and when things start coming to fruition, you're like, oh, this is what I worked like all my life for. This award looks closely at the acts of service done off the football field. And Isaiah Graham Mobley is at the foot of almost every act of service Temple's football team has been involved in. But nowhere near is his involvement more substantial than organizing a peaceful Black Lives Matter protest right here in City Hall. There's a certain level of, you know, toll that you can take until you kind of break. You know, we kind of broke and now it was like, it, it, we need to do something, we need to make a change. So the protest was like our first call to action. Graham Mobley's influence on his teammates seeps well outside the game itself. There is the scholar athlete and of course, the social leadership that is catching everyone's attention. That award embodies exactly everything that we uh, stand for as a staff and as a program and as an institution. And IGM, in my estimation, is to win the damn thing right now. The National Football Foundation will announce 12 to 14 finalists in November who will all receive an $18,000 scholarship. Shortly after, one player will be named the winner and add an additional $7,000 to their final scholarship, including that 25-pound bronze trophy. Graham Mobley says he is honored to be nominated for this award and wants to continue giving back to the community, making sure his leadership continues on and off the football field. Reporting for Al Sports Update, I'm Emily Cochran. Jackson, back to you. Isaiah Graham Mobley isn't the only Temple athlete finding time to help others. In 2020, athletes of all levels have become outspoken leaders as the pandemic has halted their sports. Al Sports Update's Lindsay Moppert has a story about a field hockey player here at Temple who has used her time off to help those in her community. Thanks, Jackson. During the current global health pandemic, people all over the world use their time in quarantine differently. Some use the time to work and others to relax. But Temple field hockey sophomore Megan Phillips used her time to volunteer at a COVID-19 testing site. In just her freshman year, sophomore midfielder number 25, Megan Phillips, earned several student athletic awards for her work on the field and in the classroom. But this summer, her most important work was done in Upper Darby. Megan spent hours volunteering at a COVID-19 testing site. I went up to the cars, made sure the testing kit matched the people in the vehicle and that we had the correct contact information. This opportunity came through the Delaware County Medical Reserve Corps, which this summer allowed young volunteers like Megan the chance to fight COVID. A lot of clinical programs did not have normal access to where they normally would go, so they're looking for our program. During the critical months of the pandemic, most people decided that staying home was doing enough to fight the virus. But for Megan, she felt although it may be easier, it wasn't enough. It was kind of a responsibility of mine to try and put myself out there instead of adults. And it was a rainy day that gave Megan a new perspective. On the day of testing, it was pouring rain and we ended up having to shut down early. My takeaway was that people around you there's so many people around you affected by the pandemic and you might not even realize it. We're just glad to have her and all of our volunteers uh, to be able to support these operations and really make a difference. There is still a great need for volunteers in the fight against COVID and Klein hopes Megan's actions will rub off on some other owls. The Delaware County Medical Reserve Corps currently has about 1,500 volunteers in the program, which is close to three times the number it had before COVID. Still, they are always in search of volunteers like Megan to serve their own community. Two weeks ago, the NCAA announced that the men's basketball season will begin on November 25th. On the heels of that announcement, the AAC has just announced its plans for conference play this season. Like all other sports, this upcoming basketball season will look much different. 20 games will be played in a double round robin conference schedule for both men's and women's teams. These conference games will begin on December 14th 
Now, there is still no word on Temple's official schedule. The conference says that this will be released at a later date. So what do we know? The Owls return to practice on Wednesday, ready to go no matter what their schedule looks like. Of, of scheduling. I think the most important part for us right now is just waiting to get the uh, American Conference schedule, and then we'll work, we'll work around that. It's been interesting to just kind of get acclimated with the guys. Uh, we've, we've had a short turnaround. Um, but, you know, it's, it's been good because we've, we've done things off the court to try to build chemistry with one another. Wasn't expecting it to be under these circumstances, but to be able to get started and actually have a season, uh, it's a blessing, honestly. That'll do it for this edition of Al Sports Update. Make sure to join in next week for Courtney Murphy and JJ Majowski back on the desk. For Brooklyn Vaughn and the entire Al Sports Update crew, I'm Jackson Neal. See you next time.